Hi, everyone, and welcome to another inspiring episode of In The Lead. In The Lead, as you know, presents extraordinary leaders who share their extraordinary leadership journeys, their trials, their tribulations, uh, their failures, their philosophies, what inspires them, their coaching moments, and a lot more. Today on In The Lead, we present the very illustrious, the very well-regarded, the much admired Sunil Dutt, President of Reliance Geo. Remember to share, like, and subscribe this episode of In The Lead. So ladies and gentlemen, presenting Sunil Dutt from Reliance Geo on In The Lead. Sunil Dutt is an icon within the telecom industry and is currently President Devices and s and at Reliance Geo Infocom Limited. Sunil has over 30 years of experience in the technology industry and was earlier the managing director for the Canadian smartphone maker BlackBerry India and also the president before that at computer maker Hewlett Packard respectively. Sunil was also the country head for the mobile business for Samsung where he is credited till date for building the Korean firm's smartphone business and making it the largest player in India today. Samsung's Next Is What campaign was launched during Sunil's tenure and witnessed an unprecedented growth in its mobile devices business. Sunil has a strong reputation for building go-to-market strategies, distribution channels, distribution information systems, and he's known for his strengths in helping organizations with their value creation journeys, turnaround and transformation, expansion, entry, growth and exit strategies, and crisis and change management. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting on this episode of In The Lead, the incredible Sunil Dutt, President, Reliance Geo Infocom. Hi, Sunil, and very, very many thanks for agreeing to do this for us and welcome to In The Lead. Thank you so much, Sujaya. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you and pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So, Sunil, this has been a very interesting 18 months, uh, you know, very unprecedented times, but also times of incredible opportunities. Uh, most organizations have pivoted in terms of their business model or in terms of their structure and many other ways of being able to reach the customer and so on. Your organization had to, uh, as part of essential services, play a very prominent role, especially to enable the largest global transition program called Work From Home. So give me a sense um, about the challenges that you would have experienced during these times in terms of having to scale up. It is also a great business opportunity. So tell our viewers um, you know, a bit about your own learning from a leadership perspective on what it meant, especially in times of crisis, to be able to stand up and lead. Uh, let me put it a little differently, Sojaya. Uh, I don't think we saw any challenges. I think I saw only opportunities and, and the whole lot of us, I think, saw only opportunities in uh, you know, every day to be able to ensure that uh, you know more than 400 million of our uh, people our customers they remain connected they remain connected to to information they remain connected to education which was all happening from home at this point of time they remain connected to their livelihoods uh, you know by changing their own business model which a lot of lot of them did they remain connected to healthcare uh, so i think there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, opportunity that we saw in terms of uh, you know uh, keeping our more than 400 million customers connected at all points of time you know there were several learnings that kept coming out at 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 each stage you know because uh, while you know exceptional times will require exceptional responses absolutely but if you build your organization if you built your business in such a manner, you know, it's on a first principle basis and built to solve a real need of millions and millions of people, right? Uh, as it has been for us at Geo. Uh, then I think these times show what kind of resilience an organization can display and right. uh, withstand, you know, any kind of crisis. And, and as I would say, you know, even grow in such trying times uh, to be able because when you're trying to satisfy the needs of so many people and most of the people are going online at this point of time and going digital, then 
to be able to ensure that they get seamless service, they get seamless connectivity, they are connected at all points of time whenever they are need whenever they need to. So I think that uh, we saw as as a huge opportunity. We did not look at it as a challenge, you know. And I think that's the reason why we were able to kind of serve the needs of our customers so well. Right. Right. And so well said, because, you know, you're actually sort of calling out the opportunity in the way in which you really uh, sort of manage this situation. I'm just wondering whether there were any insights from a crisis management perspective at all. In terms of insights, I would say, you know, uh, one being always connected to the customers, being able to listen to them at all points of time. Right. Because at this point of time, you know, when you have such diverse uh, people as we have, you know, such diversity in our country, to be able to listen to what are the genuine requirements of the customers, what are our people telling us, what are our partners telling us. I think all of that uh, is the key to be able to respond better to the customer needs. I want to move this on to, you know, you have a very illustrious career across very prominent organizations. You know, having traveled uh, this far, what do you believe is basically the, the essence of leadership, if you were just to cut everything out and say, this is basically what leading within organizations really mean. And I'm trying to get to your own leadership philosophies, your, you know, your own leadership principles. There's no one answer to it. I think there are several mm -hmm. things that bring out the true essence of a leadership in, in, an, in, an, in a person and then in an organization. But if I was to start, uh, you know, thinking about what uh, essentially is a good essence for, for good leadership, one, I think, is clarity of thought. Mm. And that that is uh, is the key. So, clarity mm. of thought, conviction, is the mm. next one. Uh, conviction in uh, in yourself, conviction in your organization, conviction in the leadership, uh, the leadership's vision. Uh, you know, for which if you have to execute on that. Uh, so, I think conviction in that is extremely important for good leadership. Uh, ability to simplify. Mm -hmm. I think is key to a good leadership. Okay. And ability to communicate with clarity. Mm. Uh, you know, so one, simplify it, communicate it with clarity. Uh, at the same time, have very good listening skills, you know, strong listening skills. Uh, have the ability to accept feedback if things are going wrong. Or if people think that something could be done in another manner, which is more effective. And then quickly be able to adapt, make changes to succeed. Hmm. I think another good leadership quality definitely is uh, having empathy, whether it's empathy for people in the team, empathy hmm. for the customers whom we serve, uh, you know, because these are some things which have always helped me. I mean, that, that's something which has always helped me in my, in my career. And... Right. Uh, in some cases, you know, I would say it has helped us. All of these have helped me achieve some very extraordinary goals with uh, some sometimes maybe ordinary teams. That's if, if people regard, regard it like that. Yes, yes. But no, I think everything you're saying is very profound and, and very insightful. You're talking about the need for clarity. You're talking about courage and conviction. Uh, you know, when you're leading the teams, whether you have conviction for what it is that you're asking them to do. You're talking about listening and empathy, which are basically life skills, especially in a crisis. Um, you know, you spoke about customer centricity earlier and listening and empathy sit right in the center of that. And especially, I'm really glad this is the first time on the show someone's talking so extensively about listening. Uh, because, you know, listening is is a, is one quality, one trait that we all, um, be, one behavior that we're all singing hosannas about. But largely for most people, listening is just simply waiting for your turn to speak. So listening is just so imperative, especially in these times. And I'm so glad you brought this up, listening to the customer, listening to, you, to your talent. It's, it's very profound, especially if organizations want to be able to, A, remain customer centric, um, sustain high performance. I think so listening is right at the center of innovation. I'm just going to move this forward to talk about the fact that, you know, you've worked for large organizations and tell me uh, what are your insights or hacks that you can provide uh, organizations or, or leaders from organizations who are listening to this conversation at this time who would want to scale up 
without making the organization a complex place to work in? Well, that's a very interesting question that you asked, Fujaya. And uh, you know, I've always said, and I've always believed in this fact that, you know, it's always very easy to complicate things. It's very mm. difficult to simplify. One will need to define, as we do, you know, we define long-term goals, mm. sometimes which seem to be, uh, you know, uh, unachievable goals. Uh, but the goals which will solve a real need uh, mm. of, of millions of people mm. or a set of people, if it is not millions yeah. of people, then a set of people that you're trying to reach out to. Right. Uh, and then it's important that, you know, you define the outcomes which are expected. Mm. And what are the dates by which you want those outcomes to materialize? Right. And then start working backwards from that. Right. That's that's the way we do it. Right. And build enough flexibility, you know, while you're doing that, build build enough flexibility to keep making changes if it if they are required. Right. But most of the time staying the course, you know, not changing it. Mm. And if there are any exceptional situations, then you know, go back to the first principle thinking, go back to breaking down the issues into smaller issues that can be resolved or solved with simple solutions, find simple solutions, communicate simple solutions that will solve the real issues. Right. And then uh, be very clear in the goals that you set for people and you communicate with people and the solutions that are required to be executed on the ground, communicate them with clarity, you know, execute, make them with, make the programs that will help your teams to execute with uh, efficiency. And right. then communicate, over communicate with the teams, do mm. as much communication as is required uh, so that the common purpose gets understood by right. each and every person uh, who's going to be executing on the vision, including yourself. Right. I think you're so right. Communication is right at the center of simplifying things and getting people on the same page. You want to move on to be able to talk about stakeholder management uh, in your own journey as a professional. You just spoke about uh, carrying partners along and, you know, that being a, a coaching moment for you in terms of the uh, whole process of being able to manage uh, stakeholders. And I mean, both inside and outside the organization. I think in this very complex um, environment where, especially as you get more and more senior within the organization, uh, the need to know how to manage stakeholders both inside and outside the organization. Can you give our viewers an insight or two on managing both internal and external stakeholders? One, if you're doing the right things for your customers, you know, for the purpose for which you are in the business. Two, if you're doing it the right way. Three, if you're communicating well and you've got a good feedback mechanism with the customers as well as with your own team members and that feedback you're able to uh, communicate as opportunities that need to be worked upon rather than constraints mm. and do it with clarity within the organization also also with the sense of finding solutions rather than you know uh, uh, making it look like impossible solution for people. Uh, I think it becomes easier uh, to manage expectations of the stakeholder, becomes easier in finding solutions. It also becomes easier in bringing together your stakeholders for the solutions. So it's not that, you know, then they leave you to it and say that, okay, you know, uh, it, it was your thought process, you handle it. Yeah. But if it is an inclusive kind of a business is inclusive approach, including inclusive communication and an inclusive approach to finding solutions. Then I think whether you are, uh, whether you're talking about external or internal stakeholders, I mm -hmm. think it's easy to manage the expectations at that point of time. Right. Right. I think with that, I'm going to ask you a question. I can ask someone with your kind of a background, which is, um, you know, how would you describe digital leadership? And uh, especially for those who are leading um, small, medium sized organizations to entrepreneurs, uh, what would you say would be would constitute sort of digital literacy, bare minimum digital literacy to lead in these times? Well, see, digital life is a reality which is here to stay. And it's a reality which is going to impact our lives you know, every day. So 
I think being a digital leader actually puts a huge responsibility uh, on us to one, keep innovating products, keep innovating services. And uh, uh, I would say everyone who wants to be an entrepreneur, whether a large entrepreneur or a small entrepreneur, or even an SME, will probably need to understand and be able to use technology to be able to take help of technology solutions. Uh, for example, you know, being able to analyze data as to uh, how is it impacting my business or what data is going to impact my business? How can I use it more effectively? What are the technology platforms which can help me build scale and build scale in a manner where, you know, individual interpretations get taken out of it, especially if you are talking about scale and you need to build consistency across the length and breadth of the country or right. across all kinds of diverse customers that you're talking about. So I think uh, <clears throat> that should help in identifying opportunities and what are the constraints and then innovate every day. So I think that is something which is, uh, which is extremely important. Second, I would say is, you know, be relentless in discovering uh, new products or new services or new ways of reaching and serving your customers in a digital way, because that is the way forward, given how the customers are changing, how their lives are changing, how their behavior is changing in terms of interacting with the, each other and interacting with products, services, everything. Right. So I think that is something which is going to be extremely important, you know, and, and there I would say, you know, for any entrepreneur, uh, one should take heart in the fact and, you know, feel confident about uh, adoption of technology by different people. Now, if you see today, uh, you go to any of the retail outlets, including yeah. some of the vegetable vendors and some mm -hmm. of the other small entrepreneurs, yeah. you would find them accepting digital payments. Yes. And yes. even making digital payments. Yeah, which is so, incredible, really. So people yeah. actually get and they adapt themselves, provided you make it easy for them. So I think uh, with that, I want to move towards asking you um, around um, a space of vulnerability, which is when you have experienced failure in some form. And what is your failure story that you believe was most impactful, a failure story that you really learned from? And uh, obviously, through the conversation with you, Sunil, today, we're trying to inspire the journeys of so many other people who are listening to you. So would absolutely want to know about your failure story and what it is that you believe you learned from it and, um, and how it may have strengthened your leadership. Well, I would say... Uh... <clears throat> I, I, I doubt if I've come across anyone who never experienced failure. And uh, so have I. Mm -hmm. uh, to a lot of people, you know, when, especially some young people, when they look at uh, the careers of some of the leaders, they think that, you know, the career bar graph would have moved up like that. When I was to look at my, my, my graph, you know, I would say, well, the moving average would be like that, but you know, it would be a lot more like this, 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 and this, and this. So it, it, yeah. it's not a simple, smooth movement upwards always, you know. So there are several yeah. failures that one encounters. But uh, I believe in this statement that failures are learning opportunities. Right. And I would, I would suggest that it should not be treated as just a statement. Right. I, mean, I always believe that a failure can either make you into a cynic or it can motivate you to overcome that situation in the future. That is, if you learned from that, from that failure. Right. So honestly, I have always chosen not to be a cynic. And I have always chosen to figure out what went wrong. Mm -hmm. I can't change that situation. But what, mm. what went wrong, I can learn from that. Right. And then, you know, change that in order to be able to overcome that situation if it comes ever in the future. Right. So it's not that I have not been kicked in my teeth. I've been kicked in my teeth a few times in my work life. One mm. of the simplest examples that I can give is, you know, being passed on for a promotion to a higher responsibility uh, mm -hmm. and that going in the favor of another colleague of mine. While okay. I always thought, you know, I would be getting it. Mm. But no, I didn't get it. So now... You know, the choice was in front of me. 
uh, whether I should feel cynical about the situation and say that, you know, this is how the organizations work. This is how leaders mm-hmm. work. They always favor their uh, favorite colleagues, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. Or do I put in my effort to understand what went wrong, what possibly could have gone wrong? Mm-hmm. Why did I not get that? If it requires have a discussion with the person and then make the desired changes and every day live with the change that you are going to be making. Right. And that's something which I have always worked towards, you know. Sometimes you will bring out a product which doesn't get accepted despite having all the conviction there was a great product and if it goes wrong and you're working at a scale, it could lead to some immense losses. Right. So key was always to learn from what went wrong what could be the solution to that? Discuss it with the right people also if it is required. Right. Because, you know, some of your some of those right people could be critics, but yeah. and they might not give you the, you know, the, the hunky-dory feedback which you're looking for. Yeah. But that's important to have those right people. Right. And then implement and move on. Right. Don't dwell on your failure for too long. And just implement what are the changes required to be done. Right. Overcome the situation, move on. There's no point staying with your failure or remembering it. Right. You know, stay the course. Keep belief in yourself. Keeping your mind, your eyes, your ears always open for learning. It always helps. Right. So well said. Always and remain a student always. Right. Right. So well said. And thank you for sharing the um, the experience of being passed up for a promotion because that is an experience that um, you know basically. Most people react to very cynically and, um, you know, sort of project outwards and find uh, externalize the blame for why it is that this may have occurred. And I I love the way you talked about reflection and going in and to go within, seek people who will give you the real feedback and re- remain a lifelong learner. So thank you for calling all of that out. So you made a very interesting comment just now, you know, about us, you know, finding an external, uh, something external to blame on. Yeah. Something else to blame on, you know, that's yeah. something which, so I give this very interesting example uh, hmm. to, to the people and I say, you know, some of us from our childhood, you know, have been taught to blame it on the others. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. No offense meant for anybody, including my, my elders in the family, my own mother or my elder sister or anybody. Hmm. And for that matter, for anyone's, uh, you know, elderly people. But yeah. if you recall, you know, when we were little, little, mm. little kids, toddlers, we just yeah. begun to learn how to take our first few steps. Mm. And when we see that happening in our families, mm. what happens is if they fall, what mm. is said? Oh, you know, the floor was not okay. Yeah. Or if they hit the table, you know, bad table, the table came yeah. in your way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. From childhood, we are telling the, the kid, it's not your fault. Yeah. We are not telling the child, you know, be careful. That's not the way to go because yeah. there is something there in, on the way. Yeah. You know, or if you have to stand, first gain your balance, then start to walk. Yeah. We are not taught like that. We are yeah. taught to blame it on something else. Yeah. And unfortunately, some of us, you know, we stay the course on that. And yeah. in our lives, we keep thinking about, you know, who to blame for my failure. Yeah. Not done. Yeah. That's something Absolutely. which we need to drop. Absolutely. So well said. Thank you for sharing this. I'm going to, with that, move on to a lot of young people. And you spoke about being open to be mentored uh, by younger people, the reverse mentoring uh, opportunities that no leader should pass up, especially in these very disruptive times. But my question to you is about uh, young people starting their careers at this time, other than the online classes. Now the joining online, which has been happening for a while, continues to happen, uh, which is you don't have a chance to be able to physically meet your colleagues, um, especially, you know, young, fresh entrants being asked to join online. Um, You know, you don't have a real feeling of a team. You've not really worked for an organization before. This is your start of your career and you're not really getting the real feel of being physically present in a workplace. Uh, what is your advice to those who are starting their careers online? I, say, I would say first and foremost is that, you know, good part is that young people are very comfortable with technology. And what I find, you know, a lot of young people who joined us in the recent 
past, you know, the last 18 months who've uh, joined us, you know, working from home, remote working. Uh, they've adapted to changing circumstances probably easier than what some of us, you know, after so many decades of experience would have adopted or adapted to. Uh, to the younger people, as I said, you know, I learn a lot from them. Uh, I would say, you know, one, identify what you really want to do. Once you've identified what you really want to do and, and spend time on it, don't, don't just, you know, think about it, you know, in, in between breaks from your favorite serials or your favorite movies, but identify with some seriousness as to what is it that you want to pursue and what is it, the kind of energy that you want to put behind it. Write that down. Write it down and also write down what would it take to succeed in that career of your choice. If you write, you get a lot of clarity. If you write in brief, you get even more clarity. Then when you discuss it with people, you start to get even better clarity on that. So convey that clarity with people also whom you are going to work with. And then understand whether your vision, your mission, your ambitions are aligned with the organizational expectations and your team's expectations. If not, how would you want to align them? Or how does your, how do your colleagues see you aligning them in the best possible manner? It would really help if you were to, at the beginning of your careers, and a lot of us don't do that because we all feel when, when we are younger, we have much more confidence in ourselves and in our future, uh, and rightfully so. But I would say, you know, identify what you're going to learn in the next six months. Because when you are joining an organization or you're joining a business or you're trying to do something of your own, there has to be something that you're going to be learning. So what is it that you're going to learn in the next six months? What is it that you want to learn in the next one year and two years? Don't focus beyond that because the way life is changing, you know, it, it, anyone would break their crystal ball beyond two years. Mm -hmm. So, so think about what is it that you want to learn and identify that, write it down, discuss it with your colleagues and see if it is making sense in your career, because that is always going to help you. Right. You know, growth in an organization is not always vertical. Sometimes mm -hmm. it is, uh, you know, at an angle, sometimes it is horizontal. And a lot of time when you move into different roles in the organization, you're actually moving upwards in your learning. And when you're getting other opportunities and for other higher responsibilities, you will always be preferred if your own learning and your own execution has been better than your other colleagues. Right. So long as you can keep your moving average going up, it's perfectly fine. Then it's not always horizontal. Another input I would like to give is whenever you're not clear about things, ask questions and ask for directions. A lot of us don't ask questions. We don't ask directions. And as a result, sometimes we lose time, we lose money, we lose energy, we lose the opportunity of building better bonds. I think all of these, if have to be done, ask questions and ask for directions. I think it's extremely important in these times, and especially, you know, in the in this present time when a lot of people are working remotely, it's even more important to you know build those communication channels because you're not always there face to face to be able to walk up and ask a few things. So you really have to make an effort to either call up or fix a digital meeting, come face to face, ask your questions, and then go off. So sometimes if you're not keeping your, your, your communication channels open, then, and, and this is for the leaders, this is for the leaders as well, you know, if they are not keeping their communication channels open, then a lot of younger colleagues might just feel completely disoriented and feel directionless. So it's extremely important to have that constant dialogue going between each other. Right, right. I think lots of uh, ideas there for young people to be able to chew on. Um, in fact, most of what you said is useful to anyone who's joining online uh, remotely at this time. 
So I think with that, um, Sunil, what would be the advice you would give to the younger Sunil Dutt? So if you had a chance to be able to now on hindsight with all the <laughs> wisdom and the experience and the expertise that you've gained over a period of time, what would you tell your younger self? Well, uh, <laughs> on a lighter note, I would say, you know, uh, worrying and stress should not be a middle name. Uh, yeah. You know, not should be a middle name of anybody. And uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, some worrying is good. Some little yeah. bit of stress is good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when I look back, you know, three decades ago and versus that, uh, the present times, I think, you know, between the last few decades, I would say, you know, the kind of opportunities which have come up now, mm. you know, uh, on, on, on the basis of those, I would say, you know, uh, pursue your dream opportunities. You should not, you know, at the age of 35 or 40, you should not be looking back and saying, you know, I wish I had pursued that. Hmm. If you really are convinced about pursuing something, no matter what it is, you know, I think you should go and do it. You should pursue it. Hmm. Uh, as a message to my younger self, well, honestly, you know, uh, no regrets in life, Sujaya, and no regrets in the journey which I have traveled so far. From where I began to where I am, I think I have a lot to thank uh, God for and to thank my mentors, my colleagues my peers, my, my younger colleagues, uh, for all my learnings, for all my success, it, it just would not have been possible without having some, being blessed with some very good teams to have worked with. And uh, I, feel, I feel very, very blessed. That's, that's basically what you want to tell your younger self, to not be worried yes. and to not be anxious and that. And therefore, I, I'm hoping that younger people in the audience will take away the same, which is, to stay on path and everything's going to work out fine. And like you're saying, pursue it if that's what you really want to do and you feel strongly about something, don't create regrets for yourself. Go out there and make that happen. And I think you've kind of um, lived that through your own career with all the choices that you've made and the sort of multiple exposures and opportunities that you've really leveraged as you sort of grew as a professional, which kind of brings me to literally the end of our conversation. And really, I could talk to you for another two hours, uh, Sunil, with you know, the immense knowledge, um, experience, wisdom you have and the, uh, you know, and the fluidity with which you're and the generosity with which you're sharing this. Uh, but I'm going to come to literally the last question that I have here for you today, which really goes out to the entrepreneurs and the, the multiple entrepreneurs that we have within our country. What would you, what insights would you uh, or advice would you want to leave with them? on being able to uh, manage on the back of the last 18 months, which has impacted various businesses in different ways. You know, you're still struggling to be able to bring some of these businesses back on track. I think extremely important question that you asked. And uh, so if I was to look back on the last 18 months, uh, I think one big, one big factor that comes into mind or one big key thing that comes into mind is what has happened is it's all changed. So everything has changed. Suddenly, overnight, it changed. So I think the need to manage change becomes extremely important in our lives. And this is whether it's a personal life or whether it is our work lives. And, you know, since you asked this question about, you know, how, how would people be able to do that and still remain agile, still remain, you know, oriented towards performance, so I would, I would say in some simple terms, you know, one is managing any kind of change needs a lot of clarity and in, in communication. It needs a lot of clarity of thought and a lot of communication uh, for why the need is there for a change and why the need is there for a change for the future. It needs data to be able to back you up because in any circumstances, people do not really need the uh, do not really feel the need to change you know comfort factor is very strong amongst people and people feel that you know sometimes there is no need to change but suddenly you know you have a situation like it has happened in this pandemic and suddenly everything has changed so how do you ensure that your people adapt to these changing circumstances so one you need to be able to give them clarity of 
purpose, clarity of thought, clarity of what is to be done. And then communicate that, communicate that repeatedly so that, and then, and then ask back whether people have understood. Ask people to respond, ask people to speak so that you are convinced that they have understood why a change is needed to be done. The other is listening and giving them honest answers. So when they when they respond, as you said a little while ago in our conversation, you know, one should not be listening to respond, but one should be listening to be able to give honest answers and honest solutions. Because any kind of change, you know, brings a lot of anxiety. It brings a lot of anxiety in people. I mean, I have seen so much of anxiety in the last 18 months. But if you're able to communicate with clarity, if you're able to give clear sense of purpose and define the role that that person or different persons are going to play in those changing circumstances, that gives them a lot of reassurance that yes, the change is going to be better for me too. Every person needs to understand how that change is going to be better for him or her. Right. It's extremely important to communicate that. And then when you are trying to make those changes, define the timelines, define clear roles, and define clear adherence in terms of feedback that needs to be coming in. Use data, use technology solutions, use platforms that will keep giving you information which you can share with all the relevant people at all points of time in real time. Because that is something that we have done. And, and you know, as a result of that, as I said, you know, we did not have to let go even one person because we were, we practiced these principles in the last 18 months and they have helped us. They have helped us a lot, you know. And uh, above all, I think, you know, what is important is transparency. Be honest, be open, be transparent about what is happening, what is changing, why is it changing, by when the change needs to be done. Of course, within the realms of confidentiality of the business, but it's important to be transparent and to be perceived to be transparent so that people can actually trust why you are wanting to bring a change in their lives. But then they will, then they will adapt to those changing circumstances. Then they will let go their own fears and, and anxiety. Right. Right. I think so well said because you've almost sort of uh, described, uh, you know, the shifts that you required uh, from a leadership perspective, from a mindset perspective in terms of, um, you know, sort of shifting the key levers to be able to drive change and manage uh, basically in a crisis situation. So you spoke about maintaining the discipline of data. You spoke about challenging the status quo, having the courage to challenge the status quo, um, you know, to drive change, to be able to adapt. Um, to clarify purpose on why it is that you're doing what you're doing with the organization. You spoke about communication and over-communication in these times. Um, the communication, including roles that people will play, clarifying through feedback, um, using data, using technology to be able to make um, sort of communication reach people faster. And then you spoke about transparency and trust, which is ever so important, finally, in terms of it's the, it's the glue that finally sticks people uh, to the purpose of the organization. So thank you for such a comprehensive response on all of that. I think that, um, you know, this is um, such an incredible story. And I think maybe at another time, maybe you should pen this down for more people to be able to learn from this. Um, so many incredible experiences and so many incredible stories. Um, Sunil, this has been wonderful. And thank you for your generosity. Thanks for talking straight from the heart. And thank you for inspiring so many of our viewers with your um, you know, your true stories. Um, you know, I think what, what is most striking is that your experience and your expertise and your groundedness is so, has, be, has, has been shining through all your responses. So thank you so much for doing that for us here today. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the very incredible Sunil Dutt, thank you. Thank you so much, Vajaya. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and uh, sharing some of my experiences and some of the experiences of my life's journey. Uh, really look forward to, uh, you know, discussion in the future as well. Thank you so much for having me over for the show. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil.
So see you again soon on another episode with another very inspiring personality on Indelete. Until then, goodbye.